So it's been about six months since NVIDIA actually launched the 3097 since they announced it, and it's been a singular month since I got mine, and well, you'd imagine, considering they've had it out for quite a long time, five months at the point when I bought mine, y y you'd think they'd be pretty fine. So anyway, let's get, let's get into this with the full disclosure of this is not necessarily the same experience you will have. It's just... Sometimes things go horrifically, terribly, marvelously wrong and you end up with a graphics card that, whilst is incredibly powerful, like don't get me wrong, the actual silicon on this ship is ridiculous. But sometimes you get a cooler where you have to basically mod the hell out of it to go ahead and even make it work. And before you ask, no, this is not a 100% isolated issue, but we'll get into that into a bit. So, GeForce RTX 3090, the big one, the one that they were teasing us with on, what was it, September 1st, September 4th? Sometime at the very start of September. Yeah, you know, they were building up to it for ages, and then Jensen Huang pulls this pupper out of the oven. It is a tremendously powerful card. Like... <laughs> tremendously powerful and I don't just mean in the sense of um you know actually rendering frames it is ridiculously power hungry which we'll get into when I go over some sort of well a, a bunch of tests that I went and conducted and the more relevant results that you may be interested to know so getting on to some of the good of it well for one you've got the performance of this card it is ridiculous I mean ridiculous the 3950X, which I bought last year, you know, for the whole thing of it being the last CPU I'll ever buy. That that has quickly that 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 statement is now completely and utterly defunct thanks to this card. Like in the space of a year, I've gone from having the most powerful CPU that you could get to a CPU that isn't actually strong enough for this card because it actually th this card makes my CPU a pretty significant bottleneck. It's really hard to get this card up to 100% usage. I mean really hard like 4k ultra max everything usually with msaa or ssaa or some sort of you know upscaling technology well, downscaling technology in order to push the card to max it is ridiculously hard to make this card actually stretch its legs you know at 1080p at 1440p why are you buying it why there is no point to it at 1080p it is so hard to get it to reach 100% usage that it's not worth getting. Same deal with 1440p, and we'll get into that in a little bit. So it is ridiculously powerful, like insane in terms of performance. The memory on it is ridiculous, and we will get into that because I have got some, you know, some qualms with the with the actual memory on this card. You know, you've got 24 gigabytes of VRAM, and that is no joke. That is that is some thrown around weight, but it has the issue of it. Not really making sense. Now you could say, oh look, it's basically a Titan RTX on roids. Correct, it does have basically twice as many CUDA cores, it has the same amount of memory, and it has a lot of the nice features that you want in a very powerful pseudo workstation card. The problem with it is, is it doesn't have those Titan driver paths, which means whilst you could do scientific workloads with that 24 gigs of RAM, it, it's sort of gimped because you just can't really make use of everything on the card, or at least not all at once. And more to the point with the memory, you may notice on this card I've had to put heat sinks on the back, that's because this card is basically being modified to run as cool as possible, because there is a huge issue with VRAM on, well, the 30 series in general, which I'll get into another time, but essentially, before I went ahead and repadded everything, and I do mean everything, the pads on the front, the pads on the back, pads for the VRM, for the MOSFETs, for the VRAM itself. Basically, if I hadn't have done that, it was running at 110 degrees Celsius, which is um, a bit toasty, you know, just a bit mildly toasty. Now, at absolute max, it reaches about 84 degrees Celsius under the same conditions that it was reaching 110. Also, that 110 degrees, that's whilst it was at 75% power limit. So it's not using it as if I had the card at full whack. That's with the card power limited, it was still hitting a thermal bottleneck. And it's not necessarily a problem with the actual cooler design. It's a, it's a problem with thermal pads, which 
again i'll get into another time so you've got tons of memory you've got tons of cuda core this thing has over 10,000 cuda cores like for reference 1080 ti the card that i used to use 3,500 card before that 1080 2500 it is incredible that they've managed to fit so many cores onto a single card that is a single gpu not a dual gpu design not anything like that i see why they called it the 3090 considering that 90 series cards have traditionally been dual gpu it is words fail me at times to try and get across the points of how ridiculously overkill this card is like, everything about it from just the size of it. Like, even if you take off the modifications, which I've had to do because we'll get into a reason why, it's three slots thick. It is incredibly chunky. Like, no joke, you could kill somebody with this thing and then still use it afterwards. It is that heavy. You know, and on top of that, this is, like, all steel. Like the, as far as I can tell, the actual steel reinforcing chassis that's throughout this that feels like steel. Then you've got a huge thin stack that is ridiculously dense. You've got this nice, you know, sort of pass-through cooler design, as I like to go ahead and call it. You've got this other heat sink, which will then just blow air straight out the back. It is ridiculously overbuilt and overdesigned. Then you've got you know, more weight. There is so much weight to this card that even if its fans were I'm not going to say dead, because I've already proved that point is completely that is completely defunct. But even with its fans running at like low RPMs, this runs ridiculously cool. In fact, this GPU, now that it has a working fan that's roughly equivalent to the fan that died, this is the coolest running graphics card that I own. Period. Like, high-end graphics card, this is the coolest one of all of them. It's a well-designed card in some respects and other respects it has its issues which is sort of the whole thing it's a lot of give and take with this card you give a tremendous amount of money and you get a tremendous amount of horsepower but you're not giving enough money to justify nvidia giving you driver pass apparently now this card can in theory and on paper game at 8k the 24 gigabytes of vram that's more than a big big enough you know frame buffer to go ahead and put all your 60 or 120 or whatever frames per second onto this card. It is plenty of headroom to do what you need to do. Which is great, don't get me wrong, it is brilliant at high resolutions, you know, 4K, 8K especially. It's pretty good, but modern AAA titles, this is not an 8K gaming card. This is an 8K asterisk gaming card, because if you want to play, say, Cyberpunk 2077 or Call of Duty Cold War. There is no way you can play those games without using DLSS. Like, the difference between DLSS on and DLSS off is... Well... DLSS on? Pretty playable. DLSS off? Generally speaking, you're expecting a game crash. Because it just... I'm not sure if it's a factor that this can't handle it, or the games can't handle it, or there is something else somewhere that means that these cards cannot actually truly game at 8k i have tried and it is ridiculously cool especially when you go ahead and look at the um encoder on this which i'll also get into it is so ridiculously sharp like words cannot define just how sharp the actual image is when you're looking at just say a character model when you go ahead and look at the 8k footage on a 1080p screen it's like that is anti-alias to hell 1440 for you, yeah, 1440p screen, anti-alias to hell, 4k, 55 inch, which is, you know, not ridiculously pixel dense, it is still an image so sharp you could go ahead and shave with it, it is that good, but it's not quite that, <laughs> it's still being upscaled using AI, it's not true 8k, which is why it sort of feels like the whole 8k claims is... Well, to put it lightly, it's kind of bullshit. And I don't like to go ahead and say that, but that's sort of where we're at with it. But moving on to that encoder, which is honestly one of the main reasons why you want a card like this, is its potential in the whole video work space, you know. For one, in streaming, it is ridiculously overkill. 
Like, because you just have so much GPU horsepower under the hood, you can play your games at 150 FPS quite easily. Yeah. Call of Duty, Cold War, at max everything, ray tracing off, because honestly, it kind of doesn't make a difference to me. It looks pretty much identical. Maybe it's just a bad ray tracing implementation. I don't know. But, yeah, ultra everything. 1080p, 150 FPS if you set it as that cap. It's around about 75 to 80% usage. And then you can stream on top of that as well as getting 150 FPS in a game. Like being able to stream that without issues and it being flawless. Words just cannot describe how ridiculous that is. On top of the fact that you can go ahead and record with it, which, you know, is a major selling point. And the actual encoder on this is pretty much... It's... It's insane. That's sort of a lot of what I'm going to say. I'm, I'm sorry if it gets repetitive, but a lot of this is going to be... It's insane. Because it's insane. The encoder on this can, I think, it supports up to about 150, 160 megabits per second or megabytes per second is one of the other i think it's megabits per second but 150 megabit per second bit rate which is incredibly high for example a generally speaking a stream on twitch would, would be about a hundredth of that you know the videos that i upload to youtube i think i usually do about 22 to 30 megabits per second and this can go ahead and encode something like five times that. It is insane how much this little card, well, little card is actually capable of. Because don't get me wrong, the actual card itself is pretty small. It's pretty much there, down to there, cut, big cut out here so for this cooler, and then around there. So pretty much this entire base plate here, that is how big the actual card is. And it's pretty small. Don't get me wrong, it is actually real diddy small card. It is both the smallest card that I have, the biggest card that I have, and the coolest card that I have, and the most power hungry. It, it's it's a lot of, um, doesn't quite make sense. On paper, and I do mean this, on paper it's tremendously good, especially with the freaking bandwidth on your memory nearly being a terabyte a second, or terabit per second, I can't remember. It's one or the other, it's a terror something a second almost. It's like 978 gig bits or bytes per second. So, um, performance-wise, it's there. It's just a lot of the implementation that NVIDIA has done and a lot of the restrictions NVIDIA has put in place onto what you can do with this card are what severely affects its actual real-world usability, performance, and applications. All right. Now, before we get into benchmarks, you probably want to hear what happened to this card so you can sort of understand the reason for my test results as they are your results will more than likely vary because of the modifications I had to do to this card in order to get it into a situation where it is actually workable. So, starting off, as we all know, there is a huge silicon shortage. And because of this huge silicon shortage, it, it, it makes it very difficult to get a hold of a card. You want to buy a 3090? Great! Well, you're expecting an answer here? No, you can't buy one. Or at least, you can't buy one from a reputable source. You can't buy it from say Amazon, you can't buy it from Micro Center, Walmart, you name a place that sells computer parts, more than likely you're not going to be able to buy a 3090 from them because they've all been scalped to the point that I had to acquire this through a scalper. I hate myself for it, I've been kicking myself for it for a long time and you can probably tell why. And this will also be a bit of a public service announcement about if you are buying specifically an Nvidia card from a scalper. I do mean an NVIDIA branded card, not an EVGA NVIDIA card. It is purely, this applies only to NVIDIA NVIDIA cards. So, we'll start off how it went. It's, go ahead and see this fancy new listing. GeForce RTX 3090, 1750 pounds, which was a little bit more than I was hoping for, but as we'll soon get into, it was a relative bargain. Brand new, sealed in box, so that's great. Card arrives and um, already things are going wrong. So during shipping, the card got lost for a day. Like, it actually disappeared off the system. They had to physically go and find it. During the time that it got lost, the actual shipping 
wrecked the box, and I mean wrecked it. This is the box that it came in. This flap here, it was like that when it arrived. It had packaging sitting outside the box and it was barely holding together. It still is barely holding together and I only kept it around just so you could see the state of which it arrived in. Not really ideal. So moving on from that, then I go ahead and pull the box out and it's got some shipping damage. A couple of the corners have had nasty dints to them, but overall it's fine enough. The box is relatively clean and I go ahead and dismiss it. It's like, okay, a couple of issues with shipping. The paperwork got lost because, you know, that hole that's in the side of the box. Yeah, the paperwork probably slipped out through that. We'll come back to that. So... I get out my new card. I also got myself this, which is Corsair's own 12-pin GPU cable, because I figured I'm really not going to want to use the adapter, considering it's a 12-pin to dual 8-pin, and even then, with what a 12-pin can pull, it's not the kind of thing I'd trust. Okay, so we go ahead and get our fancy new card, we plug in our new cable, which was a tr tremendous headache, because you would be surprised how hard it is to get cables in and out of that system. We plug the card in, start trying it out, and, well, initial impressions were amazing. Don't get me wrong, when I first got my hands on this card, it was ridiculous. It was just insane, just it was pushing and pushing. But it had a bunch of teething issues, and some of them which we will also get into. So fast forward to um, about 12 hours after I've got it, you know, it's late at night, it's like, you know, about to go to bed, and it's, I just look over my piece, and it's like, I, I've got a good feeling about this. Yeah, I have a look on the underside, it's like, wait, what? The fan that should be here, which I have since removed because there's no point keeping it around at the moment, turned out to be completely dead on arrival. It's 3am now. I am shattered. Doing an hour of troubleshooting after that, 4am. The only choice I have to find out what's wrong with the card is to take it off, and removing this back plate, it turns out that the header... It's not plugged in. Yeah, I, the cable is just not there. It's not plugged into the header. So naturally, I think, oh, there's some prick at the factory probably forgot to plug it in. I have to take the actual card off of the cooler. So yeah, okay, I'll repaste it whilst I'm at it. And that's when I discovered why the fan won't turn on. It's not because it's not plugged in. It's because it turns out there is a relatively common issue, not super common, not common to the point that you'll probably hear about it, but it's common enough that there are quite a few cases of it, where the actual fan itself, the cable, will be cut. Now, I have a general theory as to how this happens, because the way that this card's constructed is you see this metal chassis? Well, the actual radio, well, the heatsink portion of this, all these fins, the fan goes on here, the actual cable goes along the side, around the radiator fins, and then over here. Now when you push them together, what I'm assuming that's probably happening is that the actual steel chassis here is shearing off the connector if it's not in the exact right position when they're put together, which would explain why it's such a clean cut. It's probably just being folded straight in half, and then just simply because of the sheer pressure and it being a very thin ribbon cable, it probably is just snapping straight off. Okay, so we'll go ahead and talk to my seller and see if we can sort something out. No, don't worry. The seller that did this, whilst they were a scalper, tremendously good guy. I feel, feel sorry for them because they and they probably ended up worse than I did and all this. But they wanted to see about trying to get an RMA sorted, you know, get me a new fan, preferably. Because the actual silicon on this card is good. Don't get me wrong. It's just the whole factor of the, de de you know, the DOA fan. So talk to the seller, seller to us. Let's put it this way, as you can probably tell, um, I ended up with a card no matter what. <clears throat> and then moving further forwards, you know that whole thing about, ah, oh, it's a pair of price. Yeah, the card, of the actual price of this went up by a thousand pounds within three days of me getting it. In fact, no, three days of me ordering it. The day that I got it, it was a thousand pounds more than it used to be. So, you know, that's kind of unideal. It means I definitely cannot return the card and just get a refund because I, I can't afford a new one. I, I can't find a grand out of nowhere. Th that pretty much means that, okay, I am stuck with this card and I am basically up up the creek without a paddle. There's no warranty on it. Well, there should be a warranty on it. But 
because of NVIDIA, I just don't have a warranty. So, first things first, we need to go ahead and sort out the fan. We get a Noctua 3000 RPM fan because the fans on here go up to about 26, 2700 RPM. These generally sit a little bit higher than that, but it's close enough it'll work. It's a little bit bigger, so it should also give a teeny bit better cooling. And that's fine. It's not fine. Because whilst that's perfectly fine, it turns out there is a huge issue with GTDR6X running ridiculously hot. And it's not because, oh, the coolers can't handle it. It's because NVIDIA, at some point, cheaped out on the pads. They went with some sort of um, canvas-style pads, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of their board partners followed suit with relatively cheap pads. Which is all fine and good. Not GTDR6, GTDR. 5x gddr 5 on gddr 6x however that is just not good enough now you see with gddr 6x it actually runs a lot hotter you know this this even with the fan upgrade the ram was still easily reaching nearly 100 degrees celsius just with like light loads with actual heavy loads something like mining you know that you might try to do to recoup some of your costs or any relatively heavy load that will actually go ahead and stress the memory, the memory will just hit 110 degrees C no matter what. Even when you power limit it, it will hit 110 degrees C no matter what. So, um, my issues are not solved. As a result, I've had to go ahead and repad. I'll also cover all this in a separate video so you can get a proper idea of what happened. I had to repad the entire card, rip my film basically, I had to take the card away from the cooler. And then also I've stuck a couple of heat sinks on the back. Now, as a result of that, this card runs fine. It is not ideal. It is not the best way to do it. There are much better solutions than this. But it's a solution I had to go ahead and deal with, and it's it's doing the job. This card now functions normally to a degree. It does have some caveats. But outside of that, this card basically functions normally. It's just one, two slots thicker than it should be, and two... It is what it is. So I'm going to jump over to um, the whole bunch of test results that I think you'll find probably more relevant. Now, as you know, I always do an OCCT burning test. And keep in mind, all these tests are with the fixed card. I do not have results before it was fixed because it was actually crashing during the benchmark. So this is what I've had to do. So if you do have your own 3090 Founders Edition, do be aware your results may be lower or higher than these. So starting off with OCCT, GPU temps wise, this scored 59 degrees Celsius on the OCCT burning test, which is the coolest result we have ever had. <laughs> like, to give you a reference, the 1080 Ti, you know, my old card ran at 70 degrees Celsius, which is considerably hotter. The GTX 1080, 64 degrees Celsius. The GTX 1060 that we built into the average PC, 64 degrees Celsius. Now these are all running with just a, my personal fan curve, which is I think about 30% up until 50 degrees Celsius, and then jumps up to 100% by 60. So you know, it's not as if the fans are running at a low load. But we'll have got the stock boost behavior as well as power limits. Okay, so there's, there's quite a bit to be said for the cooler on this. It does its job well. Um, moving over to af actual FPS that it performs, this achieved 220 FPS, which is pretty damn good. It is relatively underperforming in this, because it should, as we'll find out, boost a lot higher than that. I think it's more of the whole, you know, the 3950X becoming a bottleneck. Okay, so 220 FPS, 1080 Ti, 166 FPS, 1080, 120, 1060, 80 FPS. You know, some pretty relatively linear-ish scaling. But it's when you get into the power draw numbers that this thing explains everything. The reason why it is so god-awfully powerful is because it is god-awfully powerful. Yeah. We'll start off with... We'll go back to front. So, the average power draw. Now, this is how much power draw it drew on average over the entire test. Now, with the 1060, 424 watts across the entire system. 1080, 490 watts. 1080 Ti, 556 watts across the entire system on average. 639 watts on average. Nearly 100 watts more than the 1080 Ti. 
and we haven't even gotten to the max power draw, which is basically your power spikes, you know, what it can spike up to, regardless of what it's averaging. So for the 1060, it had a 20 watt power spike jumping up to 444. The 1080 had a 32 watt power spike jumping up to 522. The 1080i had a 40 watt power spike jumping up from 556 to 596. This had a 103 watt power spike. This went from 639 watts on average to 742 watts peak. That is ridiculous. It's drawing 100 watts more than its average just from a power spike. Not, you know, 50 watts, which would be what you'd expect. You know, that's reasonable. 100 watt power spikes. Now, this isn't 100% accurate. As you know, I am having to do it through sensors on the actual PSU. I don't have a kilowatt, so this is what we're having to go with. But even still, and these aren't even the highest numbers I've ever recorded on this card. In fact, the highest I've seen it hit is 777. You know, nearly 800 watts of just power spiking. But that, you know, that insane power draw does not come without its benefits, don't get me wrong. It's ridiculous. It is insane. This will probably kill a 750 watt power spike. It would probably kill an 800 watt. You'd need at least 850 watts to be even safe with this card. But it does have its benefits. So we're going to now move into our 3D Mark scores. Fire Strike. Total score for this is 34,000 compared to 25,383 of the 1080 Ti. Now that is a considerable increase, but it doesn't end there. Now each one of the, let's go ahead and make sure that you know, all the cards are performing with the same sort of CPU score. The CPU for all these tests, excluding OCCT, was running on PBO mode, so allowed to boost as high as it can with the card in the system to give them the most potential performance within AMD spec. And joining across all these, it was reaching around about 30 to 31, well, 30,000 to 31,500 points across all, so they were getting roughly similar results. Now, for the actual GPU, however, the 1080i scored 27,180 on its GPU bench, which is really good. This performed an extra double. This performed with 42,649. I'm really going to compare this a lot to 1080. I do have results for 1080 and 1060 across all these, but we're going to be mo mostly focused on the 1080i compared to the 1080, well, the 3090, because honestly, this feels more like a true successor to the 1080i than to the 2080 Ti, because the 2080 Ti feels more like a side grade than an upgrade, whereas this feels like a true upgrade successor. 27,000 versus 42,000, a noticeable uplift in performance. In Time Spike, same sort of story again. You know, in GPU for 1080 Ti, 9,864. Over on the 3090, it doubled that to 19,123, a huge increase. Netting it as well almost 7,000 points in its total. You know, this thing can push frames like there is no tomorrow. It's ridiculous how much it can actually push. Anyway, we're now going to jump over to our benchmarks for Tomb Raider. And this will sort of show the best of the best. Because as it turns out, I didn't realise this, but Tomb Raider scales ridiculously well. Like, it doesn't scale perfectly. There is a definite hard you know, bottleneck towards the top end. But it does scale really well up to there. So starting off with the average FPS 1080p medium, which is... If you're playing a game at 1080p medium with this, what is wrong with you? <laughs> but you know, it's part of the benchmark suite anyway. So on the 1080 Ti, 422.8. Not bad. On the 3090, 664.2. 50% more. And generally speaking, that's what you can expect. Between 50% and double the performance. Moving over to 1440p, 192.5 to the 1080 Ti, 333.7 again. That is, what, a 60% performance uplift? And then moving over to 4K Ultra, which is what I'm having to introduce for all my benchmarks, because 4K basically max everything, including MSAA and SS SSAA or AO. There's a lot of AAs. <laughs> Seriously, who comes up with these names? 
basically the multi-sampling and super scaling. With the 1080 Ti, that achieved 41.8 with this 4K Ultra setting with you know SSAA on, I think. Super sampling anti aliasing Yeah, SSAA. <clears throat> so 41.8. This achieved 74.9. That is a 90% uplift. 90%. Which is insane. Like, keep in mind, this is still using the same CPU, the same system, same configuration, everything. Literally bench these cards one after another. 90% uplift. And keep in mind, this is on a fairly old game, which means an uplift like that is kind of impressive either way. But yeah, 90, 95% uplift. Dirt Rally, um, we kind of have to skip over 1080p and 1440p. Because at 1080p, regardless of what card it was, it basically all achieved around about 205 FPS because um, CPU bottlenecks. 1440p, sort of same issue. So moving over to 4K Ultra Everything, maxed out. Balls to the walls here. You know, GTX 1060, 23 FPS. 1080, 40 FPS. 1080 Ti, 50, yeah, 52.49 FPS. Basically, let's call it 53, just to be a bit fairer. 96. It's consistently getting 90% above its, you know, its contemporaries. It was just insane. Like, granted, you know, 1080 Ti is four years old, but getting a near double performance uplift, especially when you compare how bad Turing was as a performance upgrade. It was like 30% at most. This is insane. It's actually insane. Uh, War Thunder, which you know, we've done for quite a while. Now at 1080p, you do notice that there is definitely a leveling off point. For example, the average FPS for the 1080 Ti was 357. The average FPS for this was 402. So 50, 50 FPS increases its it's good, but it's definitely, this is not being pushed as much as it could. Moving over to 1440p high, 270.8 to the 1080 Ti, 400, sorry, 334.9. Again, pretty good, but the bottleneck is still on the CPU. So, heck it, we're just going to go ahead and throw it at it. 4K Ultra everything, multi-sampling anti-aliasing, everything balls to the wall. 34.5 to the 1080 Ti, which is pretty damn good. You know, it's a very cinematic experience. 70.4. That is basically 110%. Or something like that. That is a ridiculous increase from just one card to another. And keep in mind, 1080 Ti is no slouch. 1080 Ti is still a monstrously powerful card. But the fact that this can do over double the performance just... It boggles the mind at times. Moving on to um, GTA 5. So, you may have noticed a quite a few videos back I complained about GTA 5 having ridiculously low minimums. I don't know why. For some reason, the FPS just dropped through the floor. I found out why. <laughs> so, I, I watched some GTA 5 speedrunners, and you know, they're quite useful to get information, especially about the game. I'm um, just going to hopefully cover that up so it doesn't look like I'm sponsored. Because I'm not sponsored. But yeah, I'm also thirsty, so we're going to drink whilst we're talking about this. But the 1080p results always averaged out to about 167 FPS, despite the fact that it can go a lot higher. Yeah, it turns out if you go over 187 FPS on GTA 5, the game will just... I'm going to be blunt here, it just shits the bed. Like, it does not know what to do. The engine just dies on itself. Which is the reason why you get ridiculous stuttering, despite the fact that it's got heaps of performance to give. So there is a hard bottleneck on, really, the max performance you can do at a certain resolution. As a result, that carries over into the 1440p results, so guess what? 4K max settings, because it's the only thing which I can actually benchmark on GTA 5 without there being issues. So the 1080 Ti, 31.16. The 3090, 51.89, basically 52 FPS. Again, it's just, that's a solid 66% uplift. You know, a good solid two-thirds extra performance. And keep in mind, the 3090 itself, I can't even remember if it was even pegged at 100%. It's just, it is so hard to max out this card. It's like, what do you use it for? What can you use it for when it is just so overbuilt? It just chews through everything. Again, we had a similar issue with um, CPU bottlenecks. Moving over to Far Cry 5. 
because it turns out there's about there's a hard bottleneck of about 120-ish FPS, a little bit lower than that. And as a result, between 1080p medium and the 1440p average, there is only a 5 FPS difference, which is um, pretty indicative that you've still got a CPU bottleneck. So, again, we move over to 4K Ultra Everything, because it's the only way that I can max out this card. Now, the 1080 Ti at this, 4K Ultra Everything, um, two times resolution scaling, so basically trying to run it at 8K. 1080 Ti got 16 FPS, which is not good. Pretty unplayable. 16 FPS, whereas this managed to push 35. Again, that is <laughs> well over 100% up uplift. It is pretty much the theme of this card, and the fact that it is ridiculously powerful. The numbers will always never fail to impress you in the factor of just how much performance this puppy can give you. You know, the performance uplift of this thing is insanity. It's absolute insanity. <laughs> Especially compared to like a 1080 Ti, it just wipes the floor of it. It just it's, even 1080 Ti's and SLI would not have a chance against this, and God knows what it'd be like with MV Link. And finally, because I had to test it at some point, Cyberpunk 2077. Can I just say this benchmark took my soul from me? Because I'm going to tell you something in a bit, which is probably going to make you cry. So my Cyberpunk 2077 benchmark is about 15 minutes long. It takes place from when you are leaving your apartment for the first time to talk to Jackie to when you first meet Dexter Destrawn, aka the dude in the limo from the EA trailers. It's about 50 minutes between then and there. Now at 1080p, CPU bottleneck, so we can just wipe that slate clean. But at 1440p, so 1440p high, average FPS came out to about 45 FPS on the 1080 Ti and on the 3090, we got 90 FPS again an almost perfect doubling of performance. But the story doesn't end there, you've also then got your minimums and your 1% and 0.1% lows. So your minimum on the 1080 Ti was 35, on this it was just a hair under 60 at 58.3. The 1% lows on the 1080 Ti was 34.8, whereas on this it was 59.1. Moving forwards from that, the 0.1% lows on the 1080 Ti were 30.6, and on this, 44.9. Again, not bad. Like, don't get me wrong, the 1080 Ti has got better 0.1% lows because it's less of a jump, whereas this is halving its performance at 0.1%. The 1080 Ti is losing about a third. You know, it's not as noticeable, even though it's running lower. You know, it more, at a lower frame rate, it's still more stable overall. But the story wants to move over to the 4K Ultra, and this will be the last thing that I'll be talking about. In terms of testing, it's this this just destroys the 1080 Ti, and I do mean destroys it, it wrecks it completely. Average FPS on the 1080 Ti was 12.4, which is unplayable garbage. 12.4, 12.4 FPS, and th th this was one of the be the better ones to do. Whereas on this 32.8, which is more than double, it's it's close to triple. Like genuinely close to triple, which is insane. Like nearly, a, nearly a, it, nearly 200% extra performance on just by changing the card. Uh, the the minimum FPS on the 1080 Ti was 9.2. On this, it was 25.5. So again, actually, pretty favorable for both. It's not as much of a difference on either one. Of course, it's still a difference. It's not ideal. But it actually turns out to be in the 3090's favour at higher resolutions where the you know, minimums and 0.1% lows aren't as pronounced as they would be at lower resolutions. Speaking of 1% lows, on the 1080 Ti it was 9.6, on this it was 24.1. Again, you know, pretty favourable towards the 3090. With 0.1% lows at 8.9 and 22.3 respectively, you know. 3090 is getting quite a favourable reputation here. But this is also where I learned to hate, I mean hate, Cyberpunk. <laughs> like, don't get me wrong, brilliant game, buggy as hell, I'm not optimized as hell, not really super reliable, but, you know, these are these will give you a good idea because they were relatively long benchmarks. The, the reason why I've sort of been skipping over the 1080 and 1060 results, you know, because they're not super relevant and you're upgrading from a 1080 to this, what is wrong with you? Like, what system did you have where you could justify a 1080 but not something better? Or... Like, 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 why would you run, be running a 1080? Unless you had one sitting around, in which case, fair enough, that makes sense. But if you're, like, upgrading an old system, like a full 790K with a 1080, which is pretty common as it turns out, to a 3090, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Do 
don't do that. Get a 36, get a 3060 or 3060 Ti or 3070 or 6800 or 6700 XT because that was um that was a launch. But in terms of like 4K performance, it, don't ever play with a 1060 at Cyberpunk 2077 at 4K. 4.5 FPS, and you know how I say it's like about a quarter of an hour to 20 minutes? Yeah, as it turns out, if you play Cyberpunk 2077 at a low enough frame rate, the actual in-game time step slows down. Like, it will actually slow down the game to the point that it's an hour at less than 5 FPS. Please never make me do this again. <laughs> Seriously, I, I really do never want to try that again. It was so bad. So bad. So as we can see, it's pretty clear from everything that I've said here that this card has performance in spades. But the problem is, other cards exist. The problem for this card is it is not in a vacuum. The 6900 XT exists, you know, which is a more ideal card for gamers. You know, for gamers, it's cheaper. It has relatively the same performance. It has memory that is not insanity. Okay, so it's not really super great for gamers because both the 3080 and the 6900 XT exist and, you know, 3080 is already more than powerful enough. Also, by the way, if you are buying cards, from what I've heard from a lot of people, generally speaking, buy an NVIDIA card if you're playing at higher resolutions and buy an AMD card if you're playing at lower resolutions. It turns out, for some reason, the 6900 XT, 6800 XT, seems to have more stable frame rates at lower FPS compared to a you know, 3090, 3080. Whereas these will have much better performance at higher resolutions like 4K, 8K. You get the idea. These are much better at high resolutions than if you're buying the, you know, whatever you're doing. So, um, but yeah, in terms of gaming, this card just <laughs> doesn't make a whole bunch of sense. There are other cards that seem to make a lot more sense than this one to buy. Okay, so it's not really built for gamers. Is it built for actual work, you know, scientific workloads or... You know, maybe you run a film studio and you need something that can do CGI. Well, in that case, you're actually better at getting something else. You know, a Quadro, a Titan, you know, whatever the AMD professional cards are, because I always forget their name. They are better options than this. <laughs> because without those Titan driver paths, it's kind of gimped. Not to mention 24 gigabytes of VRAM, whilst it is brilliant for actual workloads, you can't really utilize it because it just doesn't have the driver pass to do it as efficiently. If I remember like, the Gamers Nexus 3090 video showed how Titan RTX, which is a much older card, you know, with theoretically much less performance, did the same workload in half the time because of those Titan driver paths. NVIDIA, seriously, just unlock the Titan driver paths on this. You will get so much goodwill from the community. I know you don't want to, but seriously do it. You won't actually regret it in the end. It'll probably drive the sales of the card even harder. Not to mention actually get the card in the hands of consumers. So for actual workloads, it's it's in a bad position because other cards exist. Granted, the other cards are more expensive, but they do the job more effectively, quite considerably so. What can you do with it? It's a card where it's like, I don't see the point of it existing. Like, the only case in which you can make a case for it is video editing or video editing, streaming, and anything that revolves a lot around a lot of video work because of the hardware encoder that's on board as well as just the sheer performance of it as well as the VRAM giving it a huge frame buffer for when you're working at 6K or 8K or even 12K resolutions, this can handle it. But really, that is the only place where it can realistically justify existing. Like, the card's good. The card's really good. It just doesn't have a good place in the market. It's too expensive. It's way too power hungry, <laughs> like, way too power hungry. It's... <sighs> NVIDIA, you made a great card, but you made it very hard to love. That is how I shall put it. It is the true successor to the 1080 Ti, but it's gimped in such a way that it doesn't make sense. Like, the applications which it would be great for, outside of gaming, it, it, it can't do them properly. Inside of gaming, there's no point getting it because you basically need a 5950X in order to have a chance of utilizing this card properly. Like, you need the single most expensive CPU possible to even have a chance of actually making use of it. It's, it's insane, you know. If you play at 1080p, 1440p, you know, the ideal resolutions as most people say, just get a 3080. It makes more sense. 
or get a 6900 XT or get a 6800 XT. It makes more sense. If you play a 4K 120 Hertz, because that's our thing now. Again, the 3080 does a perfectly fine job of it. And even if it didn't, you still have DLSS available to you, else I'm not a fan of it. I don't like it. I don't think it looks great, personally. It is very much a technology that you can use and utilize, and at 4K it doesn't look too bad. Like, don't get me wrong, it's still not... It's just more of... It does the job well enough. Like, if, if you're playing on a big screen like this, and I do mean a big screen like this, you're going to notice it. You're going to notice the imperfections, you're going to notice the DLSS artifacts that you get, especially if you have ray tracing on as well. But on a small screen like a 27 inch, 32 inch at most, maybe even a 24 inch 4K 120Hz, DLSS is a perfectly fine option and in that case probably just, again, just get a 3080. There's no point spending out the extra nearly double for a 3090 if that is your use case. It is a tremendously powerful card. It is ridiculously good in what it can do. But its problem is that it's badly placed, and more to the point, the issue with 30 series cards in general, VRAM issues with GDDR6X, because I'll be doing an upcoming video on this, but GDDR6X runs way too hot across the board. It doesn't matter if you're buying your card from EVGA, MSI, any of the other vendors that make you know, fancy 3080s and 3090 class cards, almost all of them have a universal issue with the VRAM terms, which means if you do buy one of these cards, you're basically going to have to void your warranty to make it usable. You know, you're going to have to repad it, or get a new backpack, or anything, just to make your card usable long term. Because otherwise, whilst the card might work perfectly fine with the VRAM reaching well above the operating temperature that is stated by Micron, your card is more than likely going to die early, get artifacts and everything else, because of that issue. Like... It's 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 annoying. I, I I I'm trying so hard to like this card. And I do like it when it's comfortable in the position that it's doing. But it really just is not in the good position. Like there are so many issues that make it hard to recommend this card to anyone. There are so many good points about it that just make you want to go it's almost great. But that on and these are excluding the whole availability issue. It is a very hard card to love. It is a very hard card to hate on. It's just not really that brilliant. It's... Honestly, as I'm probably going to go ahead and call this title, it's a very hot mess. It is an incredibly hot mess. It's the kind of mess where it's like, I want that. It is hot, but it is a mess. It is... So close to perfect. But it flew cl too close to the sun, and it is just... A mess. But it is good. It is incredible. And I will give NVIDIA its dues where they deserve them. But this card is not the be-all and end-all. There are better options. And really, you shouldn't buy one. Which sort of hurts to say when you paid for one. <laughs> but, yeah. It's it's in a very hard position. It's not a bad card. It's not a great card. It's not a good card. It is just a card that, honestly, could have been better. It could have been worse. And that's all I can really say for it. I don't get me wrong. Yeah, the actual cards themselves, especially like the the Founders Editions, they're beautiful. Especially with, you know, this all-metal construction. They're so nice to have, but... <sighs> they're hard to justify. They're really hard to justify. They're hard to justify the existence of, they're hard to justify the sale of, they're hard to justify the scalping prices of, they are hard as hell to actually justify. So this is where I'm going to end it. The 3090 is a hot mess. I love it. Don't buy one, because there are better options out there that will be much better for you. And it's disappointing that this is the way that I have to end the video. But anyway, so that is what it is. If you want to subscribe, subscribe. I'm not going to force you. I'm, I'm kind of just done after this video. Subscribe if you want, like if you want. Uh, if you want, and if you actually want to ask any questions, especially on, like how you can go ahead and mod the VRAM on yours to a much cooler temperature. Feel free to either drop a comment down below or check out my Discord page, which will be linked down in the description so you can go ahead and find me and, you know, ask questions as you need. But, yeah, uh, I'm not going to leave a link to buy it because you can't buy it. <laughs>
Um, I, I would say my usual stuff, but this has been the 117th con. I'm back, and I really wish this wasn't the video I was starting with, but we can't always get what we want. But when you do get something sometimes, you might as well make the most of it. Anyway, I hope you all have a brilliant day, and I'll catch you all next time. Okay, so we have Ratchet and Clank just gonna move around the controller here. Not bad, not bad. Down here we have Call of Duty Cold War. Just do that so we can switch over to the next one. Resume. Over here we have Far Cry 5. <laughs> and off in the corner we have Microsoft Flight Sim because, fun fact, even though it's in this sort of menu loading screen, it still uses 3D resources and actually uses part of your graphics card. All this is running on a single GPU. <laughs>